Y'all ready? Gabriella? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. The subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia will come to order. The purpose of the hearing is to discuss Iran's escalating threats and assess the U.S. policy toward Iran's malign activities. I want to recognize for myself an opening statement, which we will then have a very uh, positive opening statement from our ranking member, Dean Phillips. And so, and hey, I want, uh, as, even as we begin, uh, at this hearing, uh, I, I think, continues the tradition of bipartisanship uh, and uh, substantially, uh, and uh, because we are so hopeful uh, to uh, work together, uh, particularly uh, to work together uh, for peace and stability in the Middle East, and um, and truly uh, hope uh, for uh, positive change uh, for the brave people of Iran. With that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, the threats posed by the Iranian regime have never been greater. Yet the policies, sadly, of the administration have emboldened the regime by single-mindedly pursuing revival of the disastrous nuclear agreement forgetting the IEDs that we use to kill Americans and forgetting the drones that are currently being used to kill Ukrainians, while ignoring the regime's mass exportation of missiles and drones, terrorism and human rights violations, the administration puts America and our allies in a perilous position. There is bipartisan concern with the direction of the Biden administration policy toward Iran. On September 16, 2022, the world was horrified by the mur murder of Masa Amini, a vibrant 22-year-old woman who was arrested by the morality police of the regime for the improper wearing of a hajib. Every day, brave Iranians, young and old from all different backgrounds, have peacefully protested the draconian and brutal regime under which they are forced to live. Our message to them today is that you are seen, admired, and freedom will one day be yours. And in particular, there have been 4,000 protests in the last year. Uh, it should be recognized there have been 20,000 arrests uh, of uh, persons in every corner of Iran. But even worse, we know, we can identify uh, that there have been 550 young Iranians murdered by the regime. With that in mind, several factors contribute to the regime's ability to continue its murderous agenda against the people of Iran and its global agenda of death to America, death to Israel. Sanctions are only effective when enforced. President Biden states that he stands with the people of Iran, but actions speak louder than words. Imposing weak sanctions on a few dozen officials while turning a bland, blind eye to the evasion of oil sanctions is just symbolism. Iranian oil exports have never been higher, and the Chinese Communist Party is the number one client as it's now proceeding to accelerate the largest peacetime military buildup in world history. The release of $6 billion to the regime, building on the $10 billion available from Iraq, will fund the regime's mass murder. Money is fungible, and it is willfully negligent to assert that the regime plans to use the money for humanitarian purposes. This reversal of longstanding American policy of not paying for release of hostages puts a bounty on the heads of Americans around the world. President Trump secured the release of American citizens taken hostage, Z. Yu Wang and Michael White, from the notorious Evan prison without paying ransom. We are grateful to have Z. Yu advising Congress advising our strategic competition and national security, America has traditionally stood by the position of a strong national defense, but not a penny for tribute. The regime in Tehran actively provides weapons and strategic support to war criminal Putin and plans to build a drone factory in Moscow. The ransom paid to the regime amounts to funding Putin's murder of Ukrainians as Putin equally, sadly, oppresses the people of Russia itself. Many of these drones have been manufactured using commercially available components from the United States and Europe. The House must act to pass export control legislation to prevent products of American ingenuity to be used by terrorists. Our allies and strategic partners in the region 
sadly, are pursuing diplomatic relations with Iran, largely due to concerns about America's reliability as a partner for regional security. The administration has insulted our Arab allies and has held up critical requests for defense equipment to protect against Iranian-backed terrorist attacks. Iran's missile and drone programs are the cornerstone of the regime's leverage against our partners in the region. Iran has the largest missile arsenal in the region and was completely unaddressed in the nuclear deal. These missiles are supplied to Iran's terrorist proxies in Syria, Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Hamas in Gaza. The capabilities and quantity of missiles launched by the regime's terrorist proxies multiply every year. The October sunset of prohibitions on Iran's missile activities require action to prevent the largest state sponsor of terrorism from mainstreaming its testing and transfer of missiles. Banam Talabu, one of our witnesses today, authored a comprehensive monograph outlining the development and strategic significance of uh, Iran's ICBM program. The recommendations outlined have been critical in modern, informing modern and effective policy to counter this threat. And I urge my colleagues to review its a, uh, excellent uh, presentation that um, the people of the world need to know. Repeated fail failure to enforce visa sanctions have resulted in Iranians have, living abroad being targeted by the regime henchmen. We're told their families will be imprisoned, interrogated, and tortured. One of our witnesses, Iranian-American journalist Masa Alinejad, understands this threat too well. Exiled from Iran for her human rights activities, she has been a target of attempted kidnappings and assassination plots by Iran officials on American soil. Iranian President mass murderer Ibrahim Raisi will once again attend the UN General Assembly meeting in New York next week. I urge the passage of our bipartisan bill, the Regime Act, to stop regime officials who hate and threaten America from enjoying the luxuries they seek to destroy. This administration fails to see the big picture. The Iranian regime, war criminal Putin, and the Chinese Communist Party are working together to destroy America and our allies. The regime cooperative agreements with war criminal Putin and Chinese Communist Party we see r routinely engage in joint military drills and exercises harassing American ships and jets. America must act by implementing multi-pronged policies targeting Iranian terrorism, missile and drone proliferation, and maximizing support for the efforts of the Iranian people seeking political change and survival. Our adversaries are playing the long game, and the existence of America depends on doing the same. And I know it will be bipartisan that we work together, understanding and recognizing that we are in a conflict we did not choose. It actually uh, began February the 24th, 2022, with the invasion by war criminal Putin of Ukraine, uh, where we have a situation of the uh, dictatorships uh, acting by rule of gun, opposing the democracy's rule of law. And I thank our witnesses for their time and expertise and I yield to Ranking Member Dean Phillips for his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Wilson, and to our esteemed witnesses today. Um, some of you know that uh, Chair Wilson and I just returned from a trip to the Middle East, uh, visiting Israel, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, rest assured, the issues about which we will speak today uh, were front and center uh, in every meeting, at every moment uh, during our trip. Now, I was not a member of Congress when the JCPOA, the Iran deal, came before Congress. And while it is clear that the deal was not perfect and did not address all of Iran's nefarious activities, I do know that since President Trump's unilateral withdrawal from the agreement in 2018, Iran has significantly advanced its nuclear program, U.S. credibility has been diminished in certain areas, and we have disappointed a number of our allies. But instead of litigating and discussing the merits of the JCPOA that, uh, and why that unilateral withdrawal harmed our interests, I'd rather focus on what we do now that we are here. Uh, when dealing with Iran, I believe it's clear that uh, the regime poses a present danger to the United States of America. First, Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terror. Its regional proxy groups have attacked U.S. forces in the region at least 83 times 
in just the past two years and continue to threaten our dear friend and ally Israel, the only Jewish nation in the entire world. Second, the regime has embraced the war criminal Vladimir Putin, transferring armed drones to Russia for use in the country's illegal and unjust war in Ukraine, as the chairman has already spoken about. In return, Russia is now offering Iran an unprecedented level of military and technological support that will make it even more dangerous for the world. Three, Iran's nuclear program is now more advanced than it has ever been. According to the IAEA, in at least one instance, Iran has enriched a small batch of uranium to 84%, just one percentage point short of weapons-grade purity. They've also amassed enough enriched fissile material for several bombs. Four, finally, this Saturday will mark the one-year anniversary of the death of Masa Amini at the hands of Iran's morality police. Her tragic death sparked mass protests across Iran, as we all know, with women and girls at the helm demanding dignity, respect, and change. The regime responded with brutal repression, resulting in more than 600 Iranians killed and nearly 22,000 arrests. Such behavior and abuse of power is unjustifiable, and the U.S. must do everything in its power to combat these practices, ensure U.S. national security, and support the oppressed Iranian people. I firmly believe that diplomacy, I'll say it again, diplomacy must be at the core of any engagement, not only with Iran, but also with all of our allies and adversaries around the world. Without the ability to break bread, to see each other as human beings, no progress, in my estimation, can ever be made. The U.S. should never close the door to diplomacy if it helps secure our national interests. The Biden administration's recent decision to negotiate with Iran is an example of this. The administration made a tough decision, in my estimation, to allow Iran to receive $6 billion in frozen oil revenue for humanitarian purposes in exchange for the release of five Americans wrongly held in Iran, including Simak Namazi, uh, Murad Tabaz, and Ahmad Shargi. This understanding has also de-escalated tension with Iran on multiple fronts. And while we have not yet crossed that finish line, I am hopeful that this modest diplomatic effort will lead to more understanding and, most importantly, less instability. I'll just say it again. On the surface, I understand the questions about the $6 billion. It is my hope, it is my expectation uh, that this is a baby step, uh, a carrot, if you will, uh, to reduce this behavior, provide an incentive to modify behavior moving forward. It's also clear that diplomacy alone will not achieve our objectives. The U.S. must pair diplomatic engagement with very tough sanctions enforcement, international accountability, and very robust military deterrence. That is why the Biden administration maintains crippling sanctions on Iran's economy, its nuclear weapons program, human rights violators, and on the entities transferring money and weapons to Iranian proxies. The U.S. has aggressively pursued international accountability for Iran including supporting the removal of Iran from the UN Commission on the Status of Women and establishing a fact-finding investigation into human rights abuses in Iran at the UN Human Rights Council. Finally, the Biden administration has repeatedly stated that all options remain on the table to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon, something on which all of us, and I say it again, all of us agree. They have deployed additional military assets to the Gulf and actively engage with regional partners to ensure that military preparedness and deterrence are in the mix, including standing up a maritime task force to deter Iran from seizing commercial vessels or transporting illicit goods. Let me be clear, the Iranian regime continues to pose a significant threat to the United States of America, and these actions alone will not address all aspects of Iran's malign behavior. But by being clear-eyed about the threat, by working with our partners and allies to coordinate an international response to Iran's actions, and by using a multi-pronged strategy to include sanctions enforcement, international accountability, military deterrence, and diplomacy, I do believe we will ultimately prevail in making the Middle East and the United States safer and more prosperous for all. With that, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back my time, which is expired. Thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member Dean Phillips, and indeed our uh, travel uh, throughout uh, the Middle East last week uh, to Jerusalem, to Ankara, Istanbul, to Riyadh. Uh, it was a bipartisan exercise of uh, working together for the American people. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. John Molinar, be allowed to sit at the dais and to participate following all other members in today's hearing. 
without objection, so ordered. We're pleased today to have distinguished witnesses with us, Mr. Norman Ruhl, the former National Intelligence Manager for Iran. We also have Mr. Benham, uh, ben Teleblu, who from the Foundation of Defense of Democracies. Next, we will hear from the journalist and activist uh, Masi Alenajad. And finally, we have Suzanne Maloney from the Brookings Institution. And thank you for being here today. Your full statements will be made part of the record. And uh, we uh, ask that each of you uh, keep your spoken remarks to five minutes. And it will be, uh, we've had an excellent timekeeper today. And so we'll make sure this is done properly to allow time for members' questions. I want to recognize now Mr. Norman Rule for his opening statement. Chairman Wilson, <clears throat> Ranking Member Phillips, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today as a member of this panel. This is a consequential time for an Iran policy review. September 16 will mark the first anniversary of the cruel death of Masa Amini and the beginning of months of unrest in which Iran's people, especially its women and girls, inspired the world with their heroism. Iran's nuclear enterprise now looks precisely like what a country would build if it planned to weaponize. The scale of Iran's terrorism exceeds any terrorist threat to the United States and its partners since 9-11. Iran's militias destabilized the Middle East and its drones have killed countless Ukrainian civilians. As you review policy options, it might be helpful to consider how Iran's leaders view their world today. Unfortunately, events of the last two years give them reason for some confidence. Russia's invasion of Ukraine fractured great power unity and reinforced Western unwillingness to risk another international crisis. China's efforts to undermine the international order found an eager partner in the Islamic Republic. Rhetoric and minor sanctions dominated the international community's response to the alarming expansion of Iran's nuclear program and stonewalling of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. A similar response followed the torture and execution of peaceful protesters, hostage-taking, piracy in international waters, and repeated attempts to murder or kidnap U.S. persons in the homeland and journalists in the United Kingdom. The West stood largely silent as Iran and its proxies used Iranian missiles and drones against civilian targets in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Nonetheless, Iran's leaders must view their future with deep concern. Much like the final years of the Soviet Union, the Islamic Republic is sustained by coercion and a stale ideology that masks rigged elections, corruption, incompetence, and violence against a brave people. The social and economic successes of the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain pose a direct threat to the Islamic Republic, much as the progress of the United States and Europe sapped the foundations of the Soviet Union. We should ask next what Iran's goals uh, will be in coming years. First, the Islamic Republic requires sufficient stability to enable post-revolutionary hardliners to retain power upon the death of Supreme Leader Khamenei. Next, the Raisi administration will likely maintain an assertive, even confrontational foreign policy to splinter adversary coalitions and erode the entire international sanctions regime. Tehran likely believes that a policy of calibrated and low-cost aggression will achieve strategic concessions from a West convinced that confrontation with Iran could ignite a conventional conflict. In the long term, Iran aspires to be a, if not the, regional hegemon able to pressure the global economy through violence at the Strait of Hormuz and Bab el Mandab maritime checkpoints. Finally, Iran is unlikely to agree to long-term limits on its nuclear program or even significant reversal of nuclear achievements, but it will likely use the prospect of progress in nuclear talks as a shield against international pressure responding to its non-nuclear aggression. The decision to weaponize will remain dependent on its assessment of whether or not it can do so without discovery. Iran will likely continue to improve its missile program, including missile technology, to threaten the United States. I believe three issues are likely to dominate the Iran challenge in coming months. First, Iran will seek to prevent a repeat of the 2022 protest. Even as we speak, Iran's security forces are stifling commemoration of last year's protest using every available tool of state coercion. Another major outbreak of countrywide unrest, however, is inevitable. Second, Iran may temporarily restrain its nuclear expansion, but further testing of Western nuclear red lines is likely. 
Tehran has used the last two years of negotiations to achieve progress that in the past would have seemed sufficient to justify Western military action. Iran has failed to follow through on multiple agreements with the IAEA and blocked IAEA verification. The IAEA will increasingly question its own ability to assess that Iran's nuclear program remains peaceful. Third, Iran's hostage industry will continue. The ongoing hostage deal is welcome news to U.S. hostages and their long-suffering families. And hostage diplomacy is difficult, and we should thank those involved. But the deal is flawed and carries dark consequences. The deal does nothing to halt further hostage-taking, but confirms that doing so brings financial and political benefits. This deal leaves people behind. Dozens of hostages remain in Iran, including U.S. green card holder Shahab Dalili, longtime U.S. resident Jamshid Sharmad, and many Europeans. The deal's financial relief allows Iran to divert resources previously intended for humanitarian purchases to its security forces, missile programs, proxy groups, and terrorism. The relief also weakens existing sanctions. And last, future sanctions will now take longer to achieve their effects. I would like to close with several brief suggestions for improving the execution of Iran policy. First, I urge you to develop a bipartisan approach to Iran similar to our actions on China. The designation of a bipartisan select committee on China provides a valuable template for a structure to address Iran. Bipartisan unity will strengthen our credibility with our partners and the message of deterrence we send to Iran. Next, Congress should seek unclassified annual reports on Iran's support for terrorism, its global militia and military footprint, and the financial impact of sanctions to include sanctions relief. The Comprehensive Security, Integration, and Prosperity Agreement signed with Bahrain yesterday is an important step. It appropriately recognizes the value of U.S. partnership with Bahrain and also provides a template for use with other regional partners. We should expand our security relations with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and other Gulf allies, as doing so will increase regional deterrence against Iran. Finally, the time has come to restrict travel by U.S. persons and residents to Iran. Although we should encourage travel by Iranians to the United States, we should restrict travel, save in the most compelling humanitarian instances. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Rule, and I now recognize Mr. Talablu for his opening statement. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Phillips, distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy's think tank, thank you for inviting me to testify. It is an honor to present my analysis alongside Norman Rule. Masih Ali Najad, and Suzanne Maloney, all distinguished individuals who have greatly informed our national conversation on Iran policy. A hearing on the Iran challenge could not be timelier. This month marks the one-year anniversary of nationwide protests against the Islamic Republic, protests touched off by the killing of Masa Amini, a 22-year-old Iranian Kurdish woman by Iran's morality police. Since Massa's murder, Iran saw the largest ever protest since the 1979 Islamic Revolution, touching all 30 provinces and over 150 different cities, towns, and villages at its height. These protests do not only seek an end to discriminatory female dress codes. They are part and parcel of a larger, sustained nationwide uprising since at least 2017, seeking an end to the Islamist and authoritarian regime in Tehran. More protests will continue. The main question at this juncture for U.S. policy one year later then is, is it ready to stand with the Iranian people in practice and not just principle? And is it prepared to develop a more coherent Iran policy that merges strategies, values, and interests? To date, the Biden administration's Iran policy has largely focused on nuclear diplomacy for what was initially a better, then identical, and now significantly more circumscribed nuclear accord than the 2015 nuclear deal called the JCPOA. Recent ransom payments may be paving the way for what is fast emerging as a lesser and unwritten understanding that circumvents Congress. Also, as reported, it would lock in, rather than roll back, Iran's illicit nuclear capabilities and infrastructure. Paying ransom to the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism also will not foster an end to hostage taking, which the Islamic Republic has engaged in since its inception. Worse, at least three U.S. nationals, Shahab Delili, Afshin Vatani, and Jamshid Shahmad, as defined by the Levinson Act, were excluded from the current deal and remain hostage in Iran. The Shahmad case is particularly worrisome as he was kidnapped abroad in 2020. Since then, 
IRGC affiliated media have attempted to use his foreign capture and domestic death sentence to silence critics. Calls for kidnapping and punishment were even extended to American think tankers, such as myself and my current and former Iranian American colleagues at FDD, Said Ghassaminijad and Ali Reza Nader. Elsewhere, UN prohibitions on Iran's ballistic missile activities, as well as European sanctions against Iranian nuclear missile and military entities are set to lapse on October 18. While the EU and UK are expected, based on reports, to defend most of their sovereign non-proliferation sanctions, absent a full snapback at the UN Security Council, UN-based penalties will still sunset. This will leave Tehran politically unconstrained when it comes to ballistic missile testing and transfers. And as if already testing the waters, in a historic first, last month at an arms exhibition in Moscow, Iran displayed a close-range ballistic missile. As a reminder, Iran is home to the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. Over the past decade, it has made significant improvements to survivability, mobility, and the precision of this force. Iran's newfound capabilities, coupled with America's non-existent or insufficient response to past ballistic missile, cruise missile, and drone operations by itself and its proxies, will drive more, not fewer, tests, transfers, and military operations. Last September, for example, in another historic first, an Iranian ballistic missile strike on northern Iraq killed a U.S. citizen. America did not respond. Faced with these and other challenges outlined in my written testimony, Congress can better shape U.S. policy toward Iran in accordance with four basic tenets. First, do no harm. Washington cannot afford to offer Tehran another financial and political lifeline that sets back American policy. Second, connect the dots. In an era of great power competition and a rising tide of domestic isolationism, the American public deserves to know exactly how and why the Iran threat matters. Policymakers should continue to highlight Iran's drone transfers to Russia for use against Ukraine and China's role in bolstering Iran's military, nuclear, and missile capabilities through continued illicit oil imports. Three, bridge the gap. A web of multilateral sanctions against the same target can help impede Iranian illicit activity and send a strong deterrent message. For example, following Europe, the U.S. could sanction Iran's Press TV, an English-language propaganda outlet. Similarly, Washington should help Europe bolster its drone and missile sanctions against Iranian defense industry subsidiaries. And four, last but certainly not least, support brave Iranians. Standing with the Iranian people means making sure they can always access the internet whenever blocked off by the regime and can benefit from a strike fund whenever labor strikes are married or merged with domestic street protests. In addition to offering specific military, economic, and diplomatic policy recommendations in my written testimony, I have also aggregated 10 bills in various stages of the legislative process that can bolster the U.S. position on Iran and highlight the leadership of the 118th Congress. Among them are the MASA Act, the Fight Crime Act, the Regime Act, the SHIP Act, and CISA. These bills contain strong missile technology procurement and proliferation sanctions, sanctions on entities refining or storing Iranian crude oil, and sanctions against regime elites for rights violations, among many other helpful measures. Thank you for your time and attention today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Talablu, and we now recognize Ms. Alinajad for her opening statement. So much, and um, I want to, Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member uh, Phillips, and members of the committee, I want to start by thanking you, especially these days that we see the news of Iran being fade out from stream, uh, mainstream media. Because as we uh, sit here today, the Islamic Republic of Iran doubled its efforts to crack down on protesters, especially on women and the family members of more than 70 people who got killed last year they got arrested and right now they are in prison especially the parents of those who got executed for the crime of crying for justice a year ago when Mahsa Jina Amini 20 year old woman from Kurdistan was killed in the hand of morality police in Iran uh, it has sparked a revolution in Iran she was bitten to death while she was in the custody thousands of Iranian women get actually take, take off their hijab in solidarity with Mahsa and her family, shoulder to shoulder with men they took to the street across Iran. More than 700 innocent protesters got killed. Dozen 
are in the death row right now that I'm talking to you. Iranian women knew that any of them could be Mahsa Amini. The Iranian people, by their actions, showed how much they detest the re gender apartheid regime and its Sharia laws. But their demands were not limited just to calling for an end to compulsory hijab. The demand was clear, an end for Islamic Republic. I have often compared compulsory hijab to the Berlin Wall, and I still believe that if we tear this wall down, the Islamic Republic won't exist. The regime cracked down hard, and uh, not only arresting people, 22,000 people, but actually targeting schoolgirls with, with chemical attacks. This is exactly what Boko Haram did to its own girls, and Taliban did the same. The regime even conducted terrorism against its own population by deliberately using not only chemical attack, uh, raping girls in prison, raping teenagers, teenage boys and son in, uh, girls in prison. The Islamic Republic of, of Iran is not only one of the most brutal regime in the world, but also one of the greatest threats to the region, to Europe, and to the national security of the United States of America. Since its uh, inception in 1979, the Islamic Republic has constantly targeted individuals who voice dissent against the government's policies, both domestically and abroad. More than 500 innocent dissidents were the target of kidnapping plot and assassination plot on European soil. I still get goosebumps myself that these are happening not inside Iran, abroad on European soil, and still the European government legitimized the murderous regime of Iran. After more than four decades in power, without any meaningful reform, the character of the Islamic Republic is unlikely to change. The, per but the persecution of women, ethnic group in Iran, and religious minorities, LGBT people, from the core ideology of the regime. Recently, the regime has grown uh, bolder, threatening Americans on US soil in operations that I believe are nothing short uh, uh, short of a declaration of war. I would like to illustrate this by sharing just a bit about my own experience. I'm a survival of kidnapping plot and assassination plot. I could have been Jamshid Sharmat right now on the death row in Iran. In July last year, a man armed with AK-47 came in front of my house to kill me. Got arrested by the FBI. Um, he was not alone. There were three men from criminal gangs from Eastern Europe hired by the Islamic Republic trying to kill me. But what bothers me and millions of Iranian people, that was not, not the first time. First time, they attempt to kidnap me on US soil. And because of the weakness of the American, the Biden administration, the Islamic Republic got encouraged to hire criminals. The Biden administration's weak responses is not putting me at risk. It's putting the lives of all Americans at risk and, risk and signal to the Islamic Republic that actually you can come and target more American dissidents. Imagine if the killer opened fire in front of my house. How many of Americans, my neighbors, would have been killed on US soil? Don't get me wrong. I want to say that I don't have fear for my own life, but I want to be alive and to see Iranian people freed from religious dictatorship. But I also care deeply about the national security of my beloved adopted country, the United States of America. The administration has only taken token measure to punish the Islamic Republic, always careful not to antagonize the Ayatollahs. Their condemnation of the kidnapping attempt was vaguely worded as showed weakness, that is why the Islamic Republic hired criminals. I met with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan last year. He promised that the United States of America will protect and defend its citizens. Today, I am here that when Biden, President Biden says that we stand with the people of Iran, we, the people of Iran, really don't want him and his administration to stand with us. Please sit down with your own allies and make concrete decision to isolate 
kidnappers and the killers of the Islamic Republic. I am here to actually share a secret with you. The White House warned me earlier this year that there have been more than 31 threats against my life on US soil. And in an email, the administration strongly advised me to go into witness protection. If none of you uh, knows what witness protection means, it means that I have to change my identity. I have to change my social security number. I have to change my name and get disappeared. This is what exactly the Islamic Republic of Iran wants me and many of my colleagues who actually give voice to Iranian voiceless people in America, in Europe, to get disappeared. So clearly, I refuse to be disappeared. As you hear me, I have loud voice. Because I see my people inside Iran, they have no protections. They are facing guns and bullets, and they, are, they want me to send a message to the US administration. Americans should not be left alone to face dangerous uh, state actors, and Iranian people inside should not be left alone because the people of Iran are not just fighting against the Islamic Republic for themselves, they're trying to protect the US uh, citizens from one of the most dangerous regimes, which is called Islamic Republic uh, of Iran. The smart way to proceed this, it's not sending billions of dollars to release inno uh, innocent uh, dual national citizens. It is to isolate the kidnappers, not sending signals that you can take more Americans hostage. I want to end this to ask you, the con uh, congressman and congresswoman, to help us to ask the Biden administration to criminalize transnational repression and help Iranian people because they have simple demand, whether you like the word or not, they want regime change. And they believe that this has, the time has come for us Iranian to get rid of gender apartheid regime. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, here to answer any question from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Zelena Jad, for your courage. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Maloney for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Phillips, and distinguished members for inviting me to testify here today. It's an honor to address this committee. While I'm Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution, my testimony today represents only my own views. The Islamic Republic rep remains a d disruptive and dangerous power. The Biden administration revived diplomacy to constrain Tehran's nuclear advances and has sought to deter Iran's regional threats. But progress has been limited, and Iran's challenges to its own people, its neighbors, and to U.S. interests around the world have only intensified as a result of Tehran's unchecked nuclear program, its long track record of terrorism, hostage-taking, and violent subversion, its deepening involvement in Russia's barbaric and illegal war in Ukraine, and its brutality toward its own citizens. Twenty years after the disclosure of Tehran's clandestine nuclear program in violation of its commitments under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the regime has made exponential advances in its nuclear infrastructure and know-how, despite years of di intense diplomacy and covert efforts to set back the program. Tehran is now enriching at military-grade levels and has stockpiled sufficient enriched uranium for multiple weapons. Breakout time is negligible, meaning the international community would have little to no time to respond should Tehran choose to race for a bomb. Tehran continues to actively engage in extraterritorial aggression through its adaptive and complex network of regional militias, its development and deployment of ballistic missiles and drones, its threats to shipping in the Persian Gulf. Tehran's troublemaking is not limited to its own neighborhood. This is a regime that has orchestrated terror attacks from Buenos Aires to Bulgaria. And in recent years, Iranian leaders have demonstrated much higher degree of risk tolerance in planning attacks on individuals and entities around the world, including former senior U.S. government officials and dissidents such as my fellow witness. Since the 1979 seizure of the U.S. Embassy when the regime held 52 American pub public servants against their will for 444 days, the Islamic Republic has made hostage-taking an instrument of state policy. Tehran unjustly detains Americans and other dual and foreign nationals and seeks economic or other concessions for their release. One year ago this week, as we've discussed, a young Iranian woman was murdered in regime custody after her arrest for wearing her headscarf improperly. The Masa Amini tragedy prompted months of protests, demanding not nearly an end to the Islamic Republic's hijab mandate, but an end to the regime itself. Tehran's brutal crack crackdown killed more than 500 and imprisoned 22,000, but has not quashed the aspirations of the Iranian people for a democratic future.
Finally, the Islamic Republic has become a key player in an emerging authoritarian alignment among the great powers, providing crucial technology, energy, economic, and diplomatic support to Russia and China. For more than 44 years, the formula for U.S. policy toward Tehran that was put in place in the days after the 1979 embassy seizure, balancing coercion and engagement, carrots and sticks, has remained largely unchanged. Each administration, Republican as well as Democrat, has deployed economic and military pressure to counter Iran, and each has sought a direct dialogue with Iranian leaders. But our track record on Iran has been too modest. There have been few meaningful breakthroughs or sustained reversals in Iran's most problematic policies, and even Washington's closest partners have often proven reluctant to jeopardize their own trade and diplomatic ties with Iran. We need a new U.S. approach to Iran, one that ensures international constraints on and visibilities into Iran's nuclear activities, deters Tehran from advancing its provocative and, uh, nuclear and regional ambitions, and preserves space for the Iranian people who have fought for democracy for more than a century to bring about lasting change. Tehran has rebuffed or slow-rolled the Biden administration's efforts to reinstate the nuclear deal to a point of absurdity. Consumed with the war in Ukraine and the looming challenge of China, the administration is trying to advance informal understandings with Iran. Discretion is a key aspect of diplomacy, but while back channels can facilitate limited problem solving, they cannot provide a viable platform for managing the profound challenges posed by Iran's destabilizing policies. President Biden has promised that Iran will not get a nuclear weapon under his watch, and fulfilling that pledge will require a credible policy framework that can withstand public and congressional scrutiny. Let me also take this opportunity, as has, has have several of the members and several of my co-panelists, to appeal for greater bipartisan cooperation on Iran. The polarized debate on Iran undermines effective policy. Across both sides of the aisle, there is substantial agreement around the nature, uh, nature of the Iranian threat and the most effective tools for countering Tehran's malign behavior. Effective U.S. policy must address the totality of the Iran challenges, especially but not limited to the nuclear program. Rally our allies and partners around the world to do more to punish Iran's nuclear advances, its extraterritorial aggression, and its mistreatment of its own citizens. Reinforce deterrence through military exercises and U.S. force presence in the region. Restore efforts to enforce U.S. sanctions and rebuild the multilateral sanctions regime that was responsible for shifting Iran's nuclear calculus a decade ago. Take steps to reduce the vulnerability of Western governments to Iranian hostage taking. I'm thrilled that five Americans, including Siam Aknamazi, Imad Sharki, and Murad Tafaz, who have suffered years of abuse by Iran will soon be able to leave the country and rejoin their families. But make no mistake, there is now a $1 billion price on the head of every dual national and Western tourist, and believe it or not, they still go, who sets foot in Iran. And finally, we must ensure that we're doing our part to support the democratic aspirations of the Iranian people. My time is now complete, but I look forward to your questions and to our conversation to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. And now I recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Uh, and uh, we, it will be strictly enforced on me, uh, and, uh, and then strictly enforced on the ranking member, Dean Phillips, too, and even Kathy Manning. But um, uh, as we begin, uh, I, I really want to assure you that uh, uh, as there may be some appearance of uh, non-bipartisanship, there is bipartisanship. And uh, we, um, as you're going to be, I, I think, seeing uh, substantially uh, a great concern about uh, uh, the threats uh, that are, exist uh, and, and the uh, oppression of the people of Iran, um, we uh, should be working together. And in fact, Ms. Elena, Ms. Elena Jad, um, a question that we have or a point I want to make, the world is so inspired by the Iranian people in their pursuit of basic human dignity, the 4,000 protests, I mean, uh, and then sadly, uh, every time we turn around, the number of persons murdered uh, increases, uh, and, and, and you have to put that in co uh, context, too. These substantially young people who um, their families have lost uh, a, a dear person in their family, uh, uh, and so the moms and dads, the grandparents, the siblings, uh, how horrific is this? Um, it's critical that those who value human rights recognize the importance of not supporting the, di the dictators materially. President Trump had successful maximum pressure campaign which denied resources to the regime. How can we support a policy of maximum support for the people of Iran as they are bravely pursuing political change and uh, reversal of the oppression? And how could the passage of the Masa Act have positive impact on those risking their lives for freedom in Iran? 
Thank you so much. First of all, I have to say that Mahsa Act actually gave hope to Iranian people that finally, uh, you know, we see bipartisan uh, bill to try to actually isolate the killers. But let me be very, very honest with you. Now the United Nations actually became a place to unite the dictators from all over the world. So for that, we need actually the US government to take strong action, and here you can help us a lot, that how come that the members of the Ayatollahs, the relative of those who say death to America, they are here. But we cannot get a visa for the family members of those innocent protesters who got killed. We cannot get medical visa for those women and men who systematically got blinded by the Revolutionary Guards. And another thing is that the Revolutionary Guards itself is on the terrorist list by the United States of America when uh, you know, the maximum pressure was applied by Trump administration. But believe me, the US government should have one policy towards Iran, doesn't matter whether Trump is in power or Biden is power, Obama is in power, you have to call your allies to designate Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization. This is how you can help Iranian people who get killed in the streets. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Elena Jad. And I, um, as, as you have specific examples of uh, denial of visas or whatever, uh, uh, I, I, I'm confident that members, I, I, our office would be happy to try to assist, okay? Oh, thank you. Thank and, you so much. And so, Mr. Tellablu, uh U.S. partners in the region who oppose Iran seem to be uh, rehabilitating uh, its only ally in the region, uh, mass murder and drug kingpin Bashar al-Assad. Bashar al-Assad. Um, what do they hope to achieve in uh, being uh, given Assad is firmly entrenched with Iran and host permanent air and naval bases of the Iranian ally, uh, war criminal Putin? Uh, it's a great question, sir, and it dovetails very nicely with, I think, what uh, Norm Wool was talking about uh, a, a little bit earlier. Uh, in essence, there is no way, in my view, to separate the Assad regime in Syria from the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's been tried diplomatically several times. Uh, it has all been to folly. Uh, every time the Assad regime has used that to buy political space, diplomatic space, and even economic breathing space. So it's simply a lifeline to the Assad regime in Syria. That's, you know, discretionary note number one. Uh, number two, I would say, is that look at what U.S. partners in the region are doing. After about 10 to 15 years, in their view, many of the GCC and other countries, in their view of America's failure to contain, deter, and roll back Iran, uh, they are beginning to slowly hedge towards Iran. Not that they're becoming pro-Iranian overnight, certainly not. Gulf Cooperation Council states like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and whatnot still deserve strong American support, full stop. But the reason this hedging is occurring is because they feel uh, that unless they increasingly, even if not just politically, need to accommodate Tehran more, if they don't do that, they will have more Iranian targets and more Iranian proxy targets on their back, not less. So they're doing things to kind of win brownie points, you could say, uh, uh, for Tehran. And in essence, they're trying to avoid uh, the pressure that the regime is putting on them. We have to recognize this. We have to do better in our you know, military, economic, and political pushback of the Islamic Republic and stop the rehabilitation of the Assad regime. And indeed, uh, this is another area of bipartisanship um, as we were uh, on the delegation uh, just three weeks ago uh, and working together. And we, uh, with your suggestions and all of you, we, we shall proceed. And I now recognize the ranking member, Dean Phillips. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, to, to each of you, you know, we have these conversations time and time and time again. You know, we need a new approach. You know, let, don't stand with us. Let's sit down together and figure it out. You know, we've tried a lot of sticks. Uh, I believe uh, this new initiative, which I know is distasteful on the surface to many, is a bit of a carrot. But I do want to each, ask each of you, you know, is there a chance, can you see any possibility uh, that this potential exchange of $6 billion in their frozen assets for uh, some hostage release, that there's more below the surface, uh, that there may be a carrot there for changing the behavior, maybe aligned even with some of the rapprochement that might be occurring with Iran? I know it's not comfortable, uh, but I'm just wondering what would work, you know? Uh, what would work? Maybe starting with you, Mr. Rule, I'd just like to hear from each of you. You know, would you support any, any attempt at diplomacy with Iran? Do you think there is any chance whatsoever 
that their interests might align with some of our diplomatic tools if we leverage them appropriately? I'd love to hear from each of you more specifically about what you think we should be doing. Mr. Rule. That's a great question. I have repeatedly watched and participated in diplomacy with Iran over multiple administrations. Uh, we do not have a problem talking with Iran. Uh, we just have a problem in getting Iran to say anything that is worth hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, what has worked to change Iran behavior is a simple method. It is consistent, multilateral pressure and a sense that our deterrence uh, uh, actions are sincere. If Iran senses that it can outlast us, if it senses that our political divide in the United States can undermine that, those threats, then it simply waits because its leadership has sat in the same chair since 1979, mm -hmm. 1983 for the Supreme Leader, but he was around before that. Mm -hmm. Every few years, we change new congressmen, senators, White House personnel who come in and say, I'm a fresh face and it's going to be different. And after a while, the Iranians have seen this movie re repeatedly. So if you're looking for the solution that brought Iran to the table in 2014, it is not a single deal that provides them with a carrot. Okay, so, so heavier sanctions and more no, alignment no with... No consistent sanctions consistent. that touch the supreme leader, sanctions that are applied against individuals with no assets, no use of the financial system, no history of travel, and who are individuals the regime would rather not travel, are symbolic and may make you feel good. But you should also request in that report I mentioned, yep. what is the actual impact of a sanction placed against Iran? Because the sanctions you, that cost them money do impact their decision making. Okay, thank you. And we, I've got a little over two minutes left, so if we could each take about 45 seconds. Thank you. Mr. Let, let's go down the line here, Mr. Pablo. One of the, the relative of uh, the U.S. Uh, hostages here. She's sitting Thank here. You. Her father is in prison right now in a death row. Thanks for being with us. I'm, I'm grateful. And unfortunately, I only have two minutes. I do want to hear from each of you very specifically, very specifically, as Mr. Rule just shared, what we should be doing. Uh, first things first, uh, Iran's uh, changes to some of its security posture in the region should not be mistaken for de-escalation and should not be welcomed. The Biden administration is fundamentally misreading what is happening. Iran is not de-escalating in the region. Iran is locking in its posture. This is basically a knife in the back of Saudi Arabia for 10 years and then a handshake does not account to de-escalation. Arming training, funding the Houthis for 10 years. The Houthis are the only Iranian proxy with medium range ballistic missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iranians did not create the Houthis. They co-opted that movement there. So understand what this is first. Iran is locking in a series of conflicts, not de-escalating them, locking in a stalemate in its favor to buy time, space, breathing room. Same thing with the rehab of its states. In addition to the strong multilateral uh, recommendations for sanctions that uh, Norm Rule just mentioned, I would echo one other thing. Deterrence by punishment, not just deterrence by denial. It is not enough to have air and missile defense assets in but the region. Punishment. What is punishment? Deterrence by punishment is kinetic strikes, more okay, low, lower threshold that. for right. those kinetic strikes, and more often and against the point of origin. For example, the Biden administration actually has a lower threshold for the use of force than the Trump administration, but is squandering it because it's responding okay, I got not the, at the point of origin. I, I want to move to Ms. Maloney and Ms. Alinejad. Uh, you've been wonderful with uh, your perspectives. I want to hear um, Ms. Maloney answer this with 30 seconds left, I'll specifically. Be very, I'll be very brief. Um, uh, I agree with a lot. There's a lot of bipartisan consensus even on mm -hmm. this panel and certainly in this room, but I would make a strong uh, case for the need for direct diplomacy with Iran. I think that we have unfortunately made uh, direct engagement toxic, and that simply has no historical precedent. We held embassies in the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War. We have always had a diplomatic dialogue with the Chinese. We need to be directly engaging with the is officials of the Islamic Republic, but as my colleague said, doing so in a way that makes clear that we are not ceding ground to them. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. My time's expired. And I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Phillips. We now proceed to Congressman Brian Mass to Florida. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the time. Uh, I want to start with you, Mr. Rule. You've spent a great deal of time on the ground in the Middle East, spent a career spending time on the ground in the Middle East, and I want to help you to have you help us to, to understand the playbook for Iran uh, from your understanding, somebody that spent time there. What play does Iran run at a granular level to get influence, whether in Assyria, whether in a Yemen, uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, with different groups throughout Saudi Arabia, what is their playbook that they are 
they are running to, as I've said many times, I think they're, they're working to colonize uh, every place that they can across the region, um, gain financial advantage, gain access to resources, gain influence in the government. Tell me, what playbook do you find that they actually run on the ground to execute those operations? That's an important question. Iran has consistently used proxies, empowered, trained, and, and armed by a small group of individuals from a force known as the Quds Force. Let me pause you there. I want to have you continue to answer. That term proxy gets thrown around here all the time. Even Quds Force, Iranian Revolutionary Guard. If you can, get even more granular, granular uh, if you can, to answer that. What are those proxy forces doing on the ground? They take a non-Iranian official, non-Iranian actors empowered with Iranian capability to conduct, in essence, actions that feed into Iran. And that is as different as individuals recruited in the United States to kidnap or kill this fellow witness, or using the Houthis to fire Iranian weapons, or training the Assad regime and working with the Russians to kill Syrian freedom fighters. And the reason for that is the international community does not respond to Iran for the work of its, its proxies. We treat actions in the United States to include the threats against current, former and, and current American citizens, officials, as a legal issue, not an Iranian foreign policy issue. The world was generally silent when hundreds of Iranian missiles and drones aimed at civilian targets to, to include 100,000 Americans, and we treated it as a local air defense issue and not an Iran issue. So for Iran, it's a winning strategy. It's low cost, it in doesn't incur a, a threat of attack by the United States, and it's able to convince its, its targets that they should fear Iran or that the United States will not stand up for them. Let's continue on that thread. What do they use to create fear from their side of it to those that they want to, to engage with, to be feared or loved? What, do they, what is their tool for that? In, if you look at Sunni Islam, Sunni Islam, uh, Al-Qaeda's number one target was overthrowing Saudi Arabia. If you look at militant Shia Islam, its number one goal is to adhere to the, to the directions of the supreme leader and fostering the, 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 the influence of Iran throughout the world. They employ the cruelest, bloodiest techniques. And one more comment to build on a, a comment of Masli Ali Najad. Their techniques are often involving tools of weapons of mass destruction, which means in the United States that would be explosives over sniper scopes which means missiles aimed at a variety of targets do not turn left and right over American passports. It means women and children die along with their primary military target because by doing so and having the world stand back and not respond, they're able to say, you're alone and you'd better listen. The term you're looking for, I think, is indiscriminate, right? Versus when we put uh, Soleimani uh, into his place, it was into five pieces on the side of a tarmac where there was not collateral damage. Absolutely, absolutely, sir. Get more granular with me, if you can, about their brutal tactics. What do they do specifically that makes you say they're that brutal and bloody, whether to their own people, whether to those that they would kidnap, uh, as we have a family member here? Within Iran, the leadership well knows what happens in its prison. We're talking about sexual violence against minors. We're talking about tools that leave innocent civilians blinded or peaceful protesters blinded. We're talking about coercion against family members that leave them with the threat of destitution or imprisonment. We're talking about people who disappear in their country in a way that it hasn't occurred in the region save for Saddam Hussein's era in such a, in, in such a, in such a style. There is not a limit on their cruelty. There is, however, a limit on the amount of blood they mm -hmm. feel they wish to spill at once because they believe that in some ways is a, uh, uh, it, 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 it shows a weakness of the regime. But narrowed, focused cruelty is a very effective tool inside of Iran. And Masli al I'm sure, and Suzanne and Ben can comment on that. I thank you for sharing uh, your experience from your time on the ground in the region. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Brian Mass. We now proceed to Congresswoman Kathy Manning of North Carolina. Thank you to my friends, Chairman Wilson and Ranking Member Phillips. Uh, and thank you to our witnesses for being at this very important hearing. We all know that Iran is the principal source of instability in the region. It is a major threat to our U.S. interests and the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. 
but an Iran armed with nuclear weapons would represent an even greater, entirely unacceptable threat. And that is why now is the time to maintain pressure on Iran and continue to enforce strong economic sanctions that we have in place. But as we've discussed today, that doesn't seem to be enough. So, Mr. Rule, uh, can you talk to us a little bit more? I know you've started the discussion under prior questions, but what should the proper approach look like? And you, you mentioned earlier that what we need is a consistent multilateral pressure, that that is the only thing that works. I wonder if, first of all, can you elaborate on that, but also can you give us an example of when that consistent multilateral pressure has worked? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, in 2014, Iran came to the negotiating table because a number of drivers were present, most of which are absent today. Great power unity, the United States with Russia and China. The Obama administration had put in place the most significant amount of sanctions that had ever been placed on Iran. And truth in lending, they would have called it, I was there, maximum pressure, but that just hadn't been thought of. But it was perceived at the time that that was maximum pressure and the Iranians thought pressure would be greater. We had routine large American military forces in the region. We were still in Iraq and Afghanistan. We had unity with the Gulf states and with Europe that more pressure against Iran was needed. This brought Iran to the table. That doesn't mean Iran came to the table for any deal. It just came to the table. What you need is a policy that, that in which Iran believes its options to escape pressure don't exist. And that's difficult with Europe. It's difficult with Russia now and China. But if Iran believes that sanctions are not significant, are not serious, and the sanctions on Iran's oil industry do not appear to be enforced as robustly as they should be, it tells the Iranians they have not yet reached our red lines. And it's a very dangerous situation. I gave a list of a number of things Iran has done, and none of those things provoked military action by the United States or robust, or robust sanctions action. If that doesn't do it, if you're in Tehran, your answer is probably, I bet I can go a little farther. In light of what's happened with the war in Ukraine, in light of uh, the, the need for uh, energy in many of the Euro European countries, and in light of the burgeoning relationship between Iran and Russia, and Russia's need for the drones that Iran is supplying, how realistic is it to establish a consistent multilateral pressure, the kind that you are describing? It's not likely at all. So what are our other options? Our other options are unilateral sanctions, working with Europeans and convincing uh, other states to stand with us. It's, it's not the strongest play that we've had. But as other policymakers have stated, you go to war, economic, diplomatic, or military, with the army you've got. And that's the current world that, that, that we now face. But we should say there is a response, there's also a, an action that will happen if we don't occur. We often talk about what are the consequences of steps. There are going to be consequences to non-action as well. And you should consider that, ma'am, as you're in policymaking. Thank you. Ms. Maloney, can you comment on the same kind of question? You talked about the need for a new approach. You gave some examples, but can you elaborate on that? Thank you very much. Um, again, I agree with a lot of what my fellow panelists has had to say. The conditions that we face today for multilateral diplomacy are far less uh, positive in terms of really marshalling a coalition to apply the same level of pressure that brought Iran to the negotiating table starting in 2013. But I also would uh, commend Congress to, to think about what the United States has done over the past several years with respect to the challenge from China. It was unimaginable that we would have been able to marshal the pressure that we have, to build the consensus that we have, to broker a better relationship, for example, between the Koreans and the Japanese, to build the AUKUS, to create a wider coalition of states that are prepared to take risks and prepared to apply pressure when they understand that there's a challenge and also that they understand the United States is prepared to lead. I think the same can be done with respect to Iran. It's going to be an uphill climb. We're going to have to examine the trade-offs between applying pressure to Iran and what that means for our own economy and what it means for our policy toward China. But Unfortunately, we have made Iran policy subsidiary to these other much larger challenges, and it has fallen off the radar. I think it's obviously, as you can tell from the consensus amongst us, it's really time to put it back front and center on the U.S. policy agenda. Thank you. My time has expired. But th thank you all for your testimony. I yield back. <clears throat> thank you very much, Congresswoman Kathy uh, Manning. And we are now, as an indication of how important this hearing is, 
how much we appreciate the witnesses who are here. Uh, it's really uh, unprecedented, but the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee has arrived, uh, Chairman Mike McCall of Texas. And again, it's a reiteration of how important the people of Iran are uh, as we want the best. Chairman McCall. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this very important uh, hearing, very timely, uh, considering the action on the floor that we had yesterday, passing three important bills pertaining to Iran. And I, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here uh, to focus on the threat that Iran poses to not only the United States, but Israel and, and Saudi Arabia and the whole Middle East. Uh, this week, as we commemorate 9-11 and the murder of of Masa Amini by Iran's morality police. The administration waived our sanctions to green light the transfer of $6 billion for Iran, the world's top state sponsor of terror. Let me be abundantly clear, the Americans held by Iran are innocent hostages who must be released immediately and unconditionally. But paying ransom to release hostages creates a direct incentive for America's adversaries to conduct more hostage taking. Iran is bragging about receiving this payment. The president of Iran is saying that he will do whatever he wants with the money, even though it was supposed to go for humanitarian purposes. We need a policy to, to deter future hostage taking and one that contains, not enables Iranian aggression. A nuclear Iran, let me say, is unacceptable. And I will have a resolution on the floor stating it's a policy of the United States that a nuclear Iran is unacceptable. And in diplomatic speak, I think the Ayatollah and the President of Iran understand what that, that means. As the IEA just disclosed, Iran could produce enough uranium for several nuclear weapons within weeks, even as the regime continues to stonewall their investigators. That's why I'm so concerned the administration may have brokered an informal nuclear understanding with Iran without notifying Congress in violation of the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act. I made this point to President Biden in a recent letter that I sent with Leader Scalise and Conference Chair Stefanik. No matter what you call it, a deal, uh, an agreement, an understanding, an arrangement, it legitimizes Iran's nuclear program. And that is bad for the United States, our allies, and our global security. Time and again, this administration continues to project weakness on the world stage. And weakness, as we know from history, only invites aggression. Under US law, any arrangement with Iran needs to be submitted to Congress pursuant to the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, a submission which has not yet taken place. This is the, not the first time Congress has been left in the dark. The special envoy for Iran, Rob Malley, was on leave for months before the media, not the State Department, revealed that he was under investigation for potentially mishandling classified information. It's very concerning, deeply troublesome, and they were not transparent with either side of the aisle in this committee. Mr. Meeks and I registered that complaint to the administration, uh, I just believe that's totally unacceptable. And as we continue to face the lethal threat of Iran's missiles and drones that fuel deadly attacks across the Middle East and now Russian attacks in Ukraine, I am pleased this week that the House passed my bar bipartisan the Fight Crime Act, which imposes sweeping sanctions on anyone doing business with Iran's missile and drone program. With the UN restrictions on Iran's missiles and drones set to expire next month, which has been in place for 15 years, they will expire next month. We need to send a clear message to the international community that buying Iran's missiles and drones guarantees that you will be sanctioned. As I mentioned this week, this is the anniversary of Masa Amini's murder by Iran's morality police. Her murder is a tragedy and an outrage, and it sparked a revolution, I, a revolution I hope we can continue, because the people of Iran are oppressed by this theocracy. They do not agree with it, but they're oppressed and censored, and we need to empower the women in Iran and the people of Iran. Throughout the past year, brave Iranians have taken to the streets in protest of this brutal regime, risking their lives. 
the United States needs to do more to support the people of Iran and these protesters. So I, again, I want to thank the chairman for holding this very timely and important hearing. And I want to thank the witnesses for all you do for the people of Iran. I know that one day they will be liberated. I remember 1979 and it changed the Middle East. But you cannot keep people under oppression forever. And just as the Soviet Union collapsed, I do believe that the Iranian regime, theocracy under the Ayatollah, will collapse by the will of its own people. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you very much, Chairman Mike McCall. And I'm going to reiterate how important it is uh, that we would have the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee to come in uh, to show respect to our witnesses, but really love and affection for the people of Iran. Uh, we want uh, freedom for the people of Iran, the courage, and to recognize the courage of the protesters uh, in 4,000 different communities, uh, the 22,000 people who are being detained. There, now we hear over 600 uh, who have been killed, and the consequence to their families is um, we see the consequence to moms and dads, to grandparents, to siblings. Uh, this, this is just uh, must be addressed. and. Um, uh, working together with the leadership of Chairman Mike McCall, uh, our Congress uh, stands with the people of Iran. I'm very grateful we now recognize Congressman Brad Schneider of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses uh, for joining us today. I want to juxtapose my day yesterday with our hearing today. Uh, yesterday, uh, we spent the day marking the third anniversary of the Abraham Accords. Started the morning with a group of young people from the Accord countries, young people who brimmed with optimism and promise of possibilities of building relationships and, and pursuing peace. We spoke about new paradigms and bridges to understanding. And today we talked about Iran, Iran, a violator of human rights, pursuing a nuclear program, state sponsor of terrorism, drones being sold to Russia in their fight against uh, Ukraine, piracy assassination, and Mr. Rule, you said seeking hegemony in the region for their own purposes and economic um, means. Uh, Ms. Maloney, you talked about the diplomatic efforts to constrain Iran, Iran's nuclear advances, and they've had little effect for the last 40 plus years, 30 plus years. Few meaningful breakthroughs or sustained reversals, and you said quite clearly it's time for a new approach. Now, in 2015, I opposed the JCPOA because I felt it didn't go far enough. It didn't solve the problem. It may have solved the problem of the physics, but it didn't solve the problem of the geopolitics and had the sunsets that left Iran a nuclear power in the end. But I also opposed pulling out of the JCPOA in 2017 and 2018 because we hadn't strengthened our hand in the intervening time. We hadn't laid a new foundation to create a better way to block and ultimately permanently close Iran's pathways to a nuclear bomb. Again, Ms. Maloney, as you said, deterring Iran will require a much higher level of vigilance from the U.S. and our partners in Europe, in the Middle East, and beyond. Mr. Ben Tableau, you said we need to connect the dots. I think you're right, but I think it's more than that. It's more than just dots. It's the lines that connect us around the world, the seams where things come together. It's the overlaps extending beyond the Gulf and the entire Middle East the war in Ukraine, the great power politics. In fact, it runs across our entire foreign policy. This administration and those before have continued to make it crystal clear that all options are on the table, including military force. And I was pleased to lead with my colleague, the, the chair, to say that the U.S. is committed to making sure Iran never, ever has a nuclear weapon. But finding a, a non-kinetic solution is certainly better than war to reverse Iran's nuclear program and other nefarious activities. In particular, it's a combination of stronger ties with our allies and combined sanctions, sanctions that un unfortunately will begin to diminish immediately after being implemented, so we need to ratchet them up over and over again. We need to have the will and the resolve with ourselves and our allies. So having given a longer speech than I intended, let me ask the question. All right, Ms. Maloney, I'll start with you. We need a new paradigm. You laid it out a little bit. What are the most important things we can do here in Congress to lay the groundwork to do what hasn't been achieved in the past, to better thwart Iran, to better send the signal 
that we have the resolve and, uh, resolve and the will that Iran will never have a nuclear weapon and we will do everything necessary to ensure we achieve that goal. My fellow witness listed a number of uh, bills that are before the Congress, and I think many of them do, in fact, help to advance the overall goal of ensuring that we deter Iran and that we prevent Iran from ever having a, a nuclear weapons capability. But you mentioned the Abraham Accords, and uh, there's been discussion of the recent delegation trip to the region, and I think that there is much more that this body can do in terms of discussions and conversations with uh, policymakers from across the Middle East, um, who in many cases are seeking to find ways to mitigate their, their own threat from Iran by essentially providing economic incentives. We need to ensure that, first and foremost, obviously we have a close, robust partnership with the Israelis who have been with us every step of the way. But that needs to be the case um, with our partners in the Gulf, um, who often play both sides of the aisle, especially as we talk about a potential expansion of the Abraham Accords. It's got to be crystal clear to the Saudis and to the other Gulf Arabs that their cooperation, their enforcement of U.S. sanctions, their insurance that they do not in somehow, somehow incentivize the Islamic Republic to think that it can survive this current challenge is that going to be absolutely critical. Mr. Rule, let me turn to you, because your career spans 34 years with the CIA. It was about 30 years ago we started raising the alarm bells about Iran's nuclear program. We've done so many things, talked about so many ideas to thwart it, but today where we sit, Iran has enough material to build nuclear weapons. They're advancing in, in that program and they're making uh, are reinforcing relations with China and Russia. Uh, and I'm past my time, but if you can answer, what's the most important thing we need to do now to make sure we change the path we're going on? Consistency of a policy that says we're open to diplomacy, but will absolutely use military force in certain circumstances. The absence of consistency has catastrophic consequences for our diplomacy. Uh, Suzanne Malone is one of the wisest people in Washington, and her comments on the Gulf states are spot on. I'm going to give you an example of when we went to Gulf states and we said we would like you to cut your ties with the, your economic ties with Iran. And the, some of them severely cut their economic ties with Iran at great cost to their own economies. These states were then told in the newspaper we were secretly negotiating with Iran and that a president of the United States had offered to even engage the Iranian president of the United Nations. You have to think, what does that mean today when we ask these same countries to cut their ties with Russia. Mm -hmm. Do they expect that we will have a secret back channel that will result in the President of the United States meeting Vladimir Putin in another location? This la absence of consistency from one administration to another is corrosive and helps Iran. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, thank you for giving me the extra time. I'll take two more seconds to say you opened by talking about bipartisanship. If we can achieve consistency in Congress, the best way to do that is continuing our work together across party lines, Republicans and Democrats. I appreciate your leadership, and I yield back. Thank you, Congressman uh, Brad Schneider. And indeed, uh, Congressman Schneider and I have worked together on different issues, and uh, we shall continue. Uh, with this, I, I'm really grateful that we have uh, Congressman Jim Baird of Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I really appreciate uh, the witnesses taking their time to be here. And you know, uh, it's been said, and I will just reiterate that, the fact that a nuclear Iran is unacceptable, uh, their human rights violations is just unacceptable around the world. And you know, I'm really amazed at how much fear uh, impacts people and their thinking. And so I would like to turn my term, my time over to a colleague of mine, and he and I have been in combat, and so we 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 don't uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, we're not afraid of fear, I guess. And so with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over and yield my time to Mr. Brian Mast. Thank you, Mr. Baird. I appreciate the time. I want to continue on the line of questioning that has been brought up on both sides, the JCPOA, what do you do moving forward, different administrations, and I want to bring up some of the comments of Wendy Sherman. So Wendy Sherman, chief architect of the original uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, and you know she, I don't know if you could call it a book tour, but certainly spoke publicly about it in length, uh, you know, following her time 
uh, leaving the administration and, and during the Trump administration. She spoke very clearly about the fact that what allowed them to do what they viewed as a success with the JCPOA, that it could not have been done without Iran fully believing that the United States of America would, as you just discussed, Mr. Rule, uh, take kinetic action, would uh, go and destroy Fordo if need be, go and destroy wherever it is that, that we would need to destroy to prevent uh, a nuclear armed Iran. The, the deal could not have happened without that. So if that was the, the, the keystone, the, 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 the kingpin to, to having that deal take place, there's a very important question at play for this administration or for anybody viewing this administration, any foreign intelligence agencies looking at this administration. And this is a question for all four of you as analysts of this, of this situation. Do any of you believe that any foreign intelligence agencies view that this administration will, as you said, take any and all action to prevent a nuclear armed Iran, as Wendy Sherman said was so key? Or do they assess that they do not have that level of commitment? I will start. Um, I personally believe that the Biden administration would take military action. Whether our adversaries believe that, I don't know. I think that the exercises such as Juniper Oak that we have uh, engaged in with our partners in the region have been an important way of signaling to the Iranians and others that we are prepared to do so. I believe that the president, consistent with the kind of traditional U.S. national security approach, means what he says when he says it. And in particular, given how close his relationship is with the Israelis and understanding the Israeli perspective on this, that there is a, genuinely a commitment. But I don't think that the Iranians fully appreciate it, and I don't know that our or other adversaries do as well. Thank you. May I just chime in briefly? All of you are welcome to chime in. Thank you. Um, and it's an excellent question. Definitely can't purport to speak on behalf of any foreign intelligence organization, but trying to put yourself briefly and however flawed uh, into the mind of the adversary, uh, I think the Iranians have some significant room for confidence in their assessment uh, about American thresholds for the use of force, about American deterrence by punishment, again, that theme, and American willingness to use force in general. So even in the situation that Suzanne Maloney outlined, where our partners and allies and our, the, uh, you know, allied foreign intelligence services like Five Eyes and whatnot make an assessment that Biden is consistent with the past five U.S. presidents uh, to uh, prevent a nuclear Iran at all costs, including using the military option, I believe that Perception is eroding in the mind of Iran's strategic decision makers. Things that make that perception erode is basically a bipartisan foreign policy failure, for instance, to enforce the Carter Doctrine, 2019 cruise missile and drone missile strikes out Saudi oil facilities, no kinetic American response. The loss of American life in the Middle East, no kinetic response. Again, last year an American citizen died due to an Iranian close-range ballistic missile strike. I believe the family is trying to sue the State Department or U.S. government. No kinetic U.S. response. These things erode the otherwise tough perception of joint military exercises and consistent rhetoric across several administrations. So it's not just our rhetoric, it's the realities that our posture creates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Brian Mast. And as another indication of uh, the bipartisan uh, support for the people of Iran, uh, we've had the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mike McCall of Texas, Republican here, and now we have uh, Congressman Jerry Connolly, uh, the former president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly uh, of another political party from me. And so it's bipartisan, Congressman Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> And thank you for the collaboration you and I have experienced over the years, uh, making common cause with our allies in NATO in a terrible, depraved war in Ukraine. Uh, Ms. Maloney, uh, uh, the horrors of the prospect of Iran becoming a nuclear power uh, have been enumerated here in this hearing. Was there ever any attempt to kind of roll it back and prevent that from happening? I believe that the joint speak up please into the mic 
Yes, I believe that the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was, in effect, a, an attempt to contain and to begin to roll back Iran's nuclear advances. Had it been implemented in full, had there been an opportunity, as everyone who was involved with the deal had envisioned, to negotiate a follow-on agreement that would build upon and strengthen the provisions of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, I believe that we would be in a much stronger position with respect to Iran's proximity to nuclear weapons capability. Would it be fair to say that that, that agreement it was the first time Iran sat down with the Western allies and the United States in particular to agree to anything since the revolution? The first time since the uh, 1981 Algiers Accord that uh, freed the hostages in Iran. Now, was that agreement, the JCPOA agreement, was that, um, was that ever certified in terms of compliance? Iran was complying with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And that was certified by the IAEA in Vienna, is that correct? That's correct. Multiple times? Yes. And, in case somebody doesn't want to trust an international organization, am I correct that it was also certified twice by the President Trump State Department? Yes, you are correct. Oh. And, and that was in all respects, was it not, with respect to centrifuges? with respect to the amount of enriched uranium that had to be shipped out of the country, with respect to lowering the, um, the, the rate of uh, enrichment allowed, and with respect to the plutonium production reactor. Is that correct? Yes. So we actually had a vehicle, and it was working, and they were in compliance. And what happened to that vehicle? The Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I want, you've got to speak up. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action has collapsed since the withdrawal by the Trump administration in 2018 and the reimposition of sanctions in contravention to our obligations under the deal. So, so some of these people who were so quick to talk for a kinetic solution conveniently overlooked the fact that we had a non-kinetic solution that was working and that was pushing Iran back from that nuclear threshold by many, many, well, in some cases months and some other categories years, and now we're faced with very few good options. Is that a fair statement? We have far worse options today than we did in 2015 or in 2018 when President Trump exited the deal. And one of the biggest critics of the JCPOA before it went into effect was the Prime Minister of Israel, Mr. Netanyahu, who actually came here to Washington and spoke to a joint session of Congress snubbing the chief executive of our country, President Obama, and agreeing unilaterally to an appearance here by one party's invitation. And he claimed that this was so important, so existentially threatening that it transcended politics. Do you remember that speech? I do remember. How long has Mr. Netanyahu been prime minister of Israel? Cumulatively, I'm not sure I do have the math offhand. I think it's 13 years, longest serving prime minister. And uh, in the early parts of his tenure, if he was worried about the existential threat Iran posed, do you believe that he could have had a kinetic option to himself at that time? An option, by the way, Israel has in fact exercised in other nuclear situations, Syria and Iraq, to wit. I don't believe that the Israelis could conclusively eliminate the Iranian nuclear Today, program alone. Today, I'm talking about when he first became prime minister. The options were better, were they not? They okay. were better. And did he exercise the kinetic option? He exercised considerable covert options, but not uh, the, right. the sort of military he didn't, strike. He didn't go to war with Iran. He didn't bomb Iran. Though we hear some voices here today, apparently, thinking it's okay for the United States to do that in a much more complicated, difficult, and certain to be costly situation if we resort to violence. Would that be a fair statement, do you think? That is a fair statement. Hmm. I think it's something we've got to contemplate, and I think we have to take responsibility for the past. A lot of people who opposed JCPOA were proved wrong. They didn't cheat. They, in fact, complied. It was certified by IAEA and by the Trump administration itself, and we walked away from it. We did that, not Russia, not Iran, and we need to take some responsibility for that in trying to repair the damage we caused. I yield back. Thank you very much, President Jerry Connolly. We now proceed to Congressman Rich McCormick of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the witnesses for taking time out of your busy schedule to come to speak to us today. Um, 
Despite what the current administration would like to think, Iran continues to be a malign influence around the world. We've seen it both with terrorism, with overt gestures of weaponry, and, and uh, what they're selling to people who would do us harm. Uh, in a real way, they're funding, they're probably the biggest funders of terrorism in the world, in, in my opinion, as a military guy who, who's faced their weaponry all over the world and, and seen what they've done in terrorism. Um, to be clear, we have a significant number of Iranian diaspora in the United States who are amazing people, but very much despise the theocracy that's oppressing the people that they love as well. Um, at least from the aspect of what we've given as far as billions of dollars, we, we saw it previously in the Obama administration, I think $1.7 billion for four people who are given up as, as uh, uh, hostages, and now six billion for, uh, what is it, five hostages. You can see that A, uh, obviously it's encouraging the bad behavior, and B, inflation isn't just here in America. Uh, I think we can see that this is just getting worse as a policy, if, if you will. Uh, now we've deflected this saying, oh, this money that we paid to them can only be used for what we say it's going to be. Of course, I'd like to use Joe Biden's words against him. Come on, man. That just makes no sense. We know that that money is going to go back to Iran. They're going to be able to spend more money on whatever they want to because it frees up more money to spend on arms and terrorism and everything bad. That's just common sense. That's deductive reasoning, if you will. I think it was an excellent point that you made about that we lose all leverage and moral high ground when we say to other nations, you need to cut ties, you need to not benefit Iran economically, much to their detriment. We say, please do this as a collaborative effort, and then we give them billions of dollars to benefit Iran and their economy. I think it's pure hypocrisy. And what was really interesting, Ms. Maloney, is, is I, you actually surprised me. I love it when people surprise me because I learn. And, and you said something along the, the, the line that the Biden administration would be willing to use force against Iran if they saw them approaching something that we've essentially forbidden, if you will, or agreed upon, uh, to keep them from using nuclear arms, we'd use force. The problem is that we look at our actions that, it, that Iran would feel empowered to seize an American ship, that they would feel empowered to seize American citizens, doesn't make me think that they take that threat very seriously, quite frankly. And that's what worries me, is that we're coming from what is a perceived weakness. You said whether they perceive it is the way, the way I heard you quote say. Um, that's my concern, is that we're not projecting power. We're not projecting strength. We're not seen as world leaders. And it's creating a, a void of world leadership. I'm all for individual uh, freedoms in America. I believe in the American inalienable rights. The question is I had to the panel is should we as a policy, not allow Americans to travel to Iran, given that we continue to have this bad behavior, um, if we're going to continue to have to bail people out. In other words, usually we give people the freedom to take their chances, but given the fact that they're just doing this over and over again, it becomes a source of income, should we literally say, no more, you can't do it? May I take the question? Please. Um, yeah, I have no fear to say that the U.S. government must warn its own citizen not to travel Iran because my beloved country, Iran, under Islamic Republic, is not land of tourists. It is land of uh, terrorism. And that actually, there is proof and high-ranking mem high member of Revolutionary Guard saying that we are suffering from economic crisis in Iran and I have a solution. He's the main advisor of uh, Ali Khamenei. Um, he says that, Mohsen Reza, he says that if we take 10,000 Americans hostage, we can actually help our economic situation in Iran. So it is clear. And uh, let, let me, I, I really want to say that. It, it, we spent like one hour, two hours, I lost the time. The tr the, we're talking about nuclear um, deal. And this is the conversation that mostly American policymaker cares about it, and mostly they spend time to talk about this. But believe me, Iranian people, they moved on. The problem in Iran is not nuclear, you know, deal. I'm not agreeing with what 
oh, everything Trump did. I'm not agreeing with, uh, you know, uh, all his policy. But believe me, Iranian people were thanking him for walking out from nuclear deal. Believe me, Iranian people were celebrating when Qasem Soleimani got killed because he was a terrorist. He killed a lot of innocent people. Don't get me wrong, we're not encouraging, we're not warmongers. The true warmongers are the Islamic Republic actually killing its, their own teenagers, sending drones to uh, Putin to kill innocent children in Ukraine. So for years and years, everywhere we go, we just hear talking about, we want to stop Iran from uh, having a nuclear um, bomb. But how? How? You spend the resources of Americans for two decades, you achieved nothing. The, the moment when Iranian people calling Obama, Obama, you either with us or with the Islamic Republic, Obama was sending secret letter to the Khamenei, to the supreme leader of Iran, instead of supporting Iranian people. Believe me, we're not calling you to bring democracy for us. We're not actually asking Americans to help us. Clearly, we're asking you to stop helping the killers. Imagine. Imagine in your neighborhood, there is an abusive man raping girls, raping teenagers. What would you do? You report him to the police. You're not going and giving him money and asking him, oh, okay, please stop, don't rape children. No, this is what we, the people of Iran are doing. We want to make the Islamic Republic, the terrorist regime of Iran responsible, taking them to the court, to international court. And then in the middle of our way, we see as our fellow uh, panelists clearly mentioned secret and parallel negotiation with the killers, with the rapists. So, yes, I know that you want an Iran without bomb, but Iran is, the Islamic Republic is not trust, you cannot trust them. And what I want is clear that help us to end this regime. Because an Iran without the Islamic Republic will benefit the United States of America as well. We, the people of Iran, are better allies for the Americans. You meet with Ibrahim Raisi, you meet with secretly at the United Nations, you meet with them, you secretly call the killers, but you don't even dare to meet with us. The Biden administra administration asked me to, to get disappeared. Biden President Biden doesn't want to meet with me. Don't do anything when I got killed here at the United States of America. Now you have to listen to the voice of Iranian women. That's all thank, we want. And thank you very much, uh, Congressman. Couldn't Rich. sum it up better. Here, here. Chair, here. thank you. Uh, amen. Uh, we now proceed to Congressman Brad Sherman of California. We were in a strong position in 2014, 2015. We had effective sanctions, particularly the banking sanctions. We had international support and compliance with those sanctions. And we had an American public attitude that would allow us to convey a credible threat of military action. And then finally, we had an Iranian uh, nuclear program that had not been hardened against um, uh, airstrikes. Today, we are in a weaker position. Uh, we ha still have the sanctions, and then they grab a hostage, and we waive this or that aspect of the sanctions. We certainly have no international support. Um, and uh, the American public is less um, enthusiastic, uh, to use a word, uh, about the use of American military force in the Middle East. I think both sides of this argument agree that we had a strong position in 2014, 2015. Those who supported uh, the JCPOA said, we had this great position, that's why we got such a great deal. Others uh, said, uh, we have such a strong position, we should get a better deal. Uh, now we're in a weaker position. Uh, others uh, during this uh, uh, hearing have argued that we need to create in the mines in Tehran a credible threat of military force. In order to do that, we would have to have a credible threat of military force. Uh, I think both doves and hawks agree that it'd be great for Tehran to fear military action and then not have to engage in the military action. Dove, uh, it, it, uh, but um, 
I think that the risk of, um, well, let, I think the American people might support action if it was highly effective and um, a, not terribly costly. Um, and uh, so I'll ask, uh, uh, and I hope I mispronounce your name right, uh, Mr. Uh, Talibu, um, how vulnerable is the Iran nuclear program, not to commandos on the ground and an invasion and a million forces. Yeah, I realize if we could deploy a million troops, we could do something. How vulnerable is that program? How many years or months could it be set back uh, by uh, two or three days of American uh, Air Force action? Uh, thank you, Congressman. It's an important question. Uh, I don't think any air campaign of, you know, two or three days would totally resolve the Iranian nuclear program. And uh, because Iran is likely to respond, it would beget a cycle of escalation that the U.S. or Israel or whatever state engaging in the military option right. would have to be prepared to absorb, uh, offset, deter, and again, kinetically respond to. I think it'll be, you know, several thousand sorties. Uh, but but ne never forget this. There's always a bigger bomb. The Iranians tunnel deeper. The Americans produce uh, different, uh, you know, massive ordnance penetrators. Uh, the U.S. should not be in the business of even rhetorically of diminishing its own military deterrence. So I have confidence in the U.S. military capability. It's more a question of making well, sure but, that the Islamic Republic You're both saying you have confidence in the ability, but a, but a few days of bombing wouldn't set them back very far. Well, why would you engage in a limited time, a time limited campaign? Why why would the uh, U.S. Be, limit its, okay. its duration? Uh, because the American people pulled, demanded that we pull out of Afghanistan. The American people demanded we pulled out of Iraq. That's right. Neither political party uh, was in favor of even leaving a few uh, thousand troops in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, uh, you cannot have a credible threat of military force if the military force that is credible does not credibly correlate with the public opinion in a democracy. But let me move on to uh, uh, another question, and uh, that is, uh, we have in the past provided tiny uh, amounts of uh, open aid to pro-democracy forces in Iran. I remember it was once national headline that we provided $3 million. First time I saw $3 million above the fold in the newspaper, uh, back when we had newspapers. Um, should we be providing covert or overt aid uh, to uh, democracy forces? And uh, to what? And uh, I realize uh, one of our witnesses has spoke eloquently about standing with the people. Uh, we can put economic pressure on the regime, uh, which uh, uh, may hurt the Iranian people. But what about funding democracy forces, uh, Ms. Maloney? Uh, uh, would those forces be more successful if they were funded? And would they be hurt by being associated by the, uh, with American aid? This is an issue I've talked and written about, and I will say my own views have changed over the years. I have worried about the taint that American funding might put on legitimately uh, Iranian groups. In Although terms of that, that taint will exist in either case. If we don't give them money, Tehran will say we do. And if we do give them money, we'll say we don't. So, uh, And that's exactly the position that I hold today. I think that we need to put all, uh, all of our efforts toward helping the Iranian people to see what they've been fighting for for more than a century. I do believe that the regime is more fragile than it has ever been, despite the, the apparent diplomatic heft that it has through its relationships with Russia and China. And I do believe that the Iranian people are more coherent uh, in terms of their own mobilization against the regime and that what we saw last September with the protests in the wake of the death of Masa Amini will one day be seen as the beginning of the end of the Islamic Republic. Well, I, uh, I hope someday that we're as robust as Tehran accuses us, us of being. And I, regard, and I regard the greatest weakness of that regime, not a weakness that they don't have enough concrete protecting their nuclear uh, facility but that they don't have uh, the support of the uh, Iranian people. I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Brad Sherman. We now proceed to Congressman Mike Lawler of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to enter uh, one of our witnesses, Mr. Benam Ben Talablu. Uh, his report on Iran's ballistic missile program into the record, specifically pages 21 to 29. Now, it shall be admitted. Thank you. Um, on Monday, the 22nd anniversary of September 11th, 
2001. The Biden administration informed Congress that it struck a deal with Iran to swap prisoners uh, and release $6 billion in frozen Iranian funds. And let me be very clear. Our President, Joe Biden, announced that he would give the worst state sponsor of terrorism $6 billion on the anniversary of the worst terrorist attack in the history of our nation. It is unconscionable. And while this administration claims the funds will be spent on humanitarian aid, the Iranian president said, quote, this money belongs to the Iranian people, the Iranian government, so the Islamic Republic of Iran will decide what to do with this money, end quote. This administration should be absolutely ashamed of itself. We should not only never be trading dollars for hostages, and yes, we want those hostages to come home, but we traded hostages for hostages and gave them $6 billion. That's what you call idiotic. So it seems like either our administration is lying, or the Iranian regime is lying, or both. Who knows? What accountability measures are in place to ensure that this money doesn't fund terrorism or Iran's nuclear program? Does anybody know? Sir, I think you can have confidence and I want to be careful how I parse this. The administration is correct to say that all transactions in Qatar will be very carefully scrutinized and can be stopped if they go for non-humanitarian issues. Package one. Package two, this amount of money will likely free up a similar amount of money within Tehran that would have been intended for the same humanitarian purchases. This money can now be used largely to sustain the regime on the inside, but to fund in a highly meaningful and impactful way terrorism, the support of their security services, and the support of their missile program. And that will be very difficult to follow, and the administration will we'll have great difficulty saying that, that that isn't occurring. So in other words, we just gave them $6 billion to shift around another $6 billion within their own country to fund the very terrorism or nuclear programs that we're trying to stop. Is that correct? That is a, that is a, that is a fair statement, sir. Do you all agree with that? Okay. The money goes to morality police to kill more Mahsa Amini. The money goes to Revolutionary Guards to kill more children in Ukraine. The money goes to the relative of the Ayatollahs to actually promote Sharia laws to oppress more women in Iran. We all know that. And that's why I wanted actually to address that the uh, Ghazal Sharmad is, is here. That money was supposed actually to free a father who is on the death row. Her father is on the death row. American is an Iranian prison. If they hand out six billion of dollars, why they left uh, Jamshid Charmat behind? My chief of staff, Sardar Pasha's brother, is in Iran being hostage in the hand of Iranian regime. So they found the tactic when the US government does nothing, they either get the dual national citizen and kill them or ask for more money, or they get the family members of US citizens hostage inside Iran to silence us. So that is why we all believe that this money, with the help of the U.S. administration and the Iranian uh, ad government, it goes to kill more people inside Iran, in the region, and in the heart of Europe in Ukraine. No question, which is why it never should have been released, period. Uh, in recent months, Iran has exported, uh, exported by some estimates more than 2 million barrels of crude oil, uh, with the vast majority headed to China. Uh, earlier this year, my colleague Jared Moskowitz and I introduced the SHIP Act uh, to require the imposition of additional sanctions on the Iranian oil trade, specifically targeting ports and refineries that knowingly process Iranian oil. Do you think this legislation is critically important to apply more sanctions on Iran and countries like China uh, who are, are trading Iranian oil uh, in large quantities? 
if, if I may take that, sir, I yep. would say absolutely. It builds on a very helpful architecture of existing oil and petrochemical sanctions that the U.S. Congress has helped get the U.S. executive branch to implement and enforce. Uh, in the past, there were sanctions on the sale, supply, transfer, and insurance of oil. The Trump administration beefed that up with adding the storage of oil. This beefs that up further by adding the refining. So again, like an accordion, scaling up and down as Iran sanctions violating scale up and down. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Mike Lawler. We now proceed to Congressman Jared Mos Moskowitz of Florida. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, as my previous colleague just mentioned, obviously, you know, this issue is very bipartisan. There's a lot of bipartisan pieces of legislation that are moving through Congress, one being the SHIP Act that I'm doing with Congressman Lawler. Additionally, the letter uh, that we sent to President Biden, myself, and Congresswoman Nancy Mace, uh, asking them to deny a visa uh, for the Iranian president to come to the UN. I do not believe the Iranian president should have the League of Nations at his disposal uh, at the United Nations. By the way, that happened once before uh, under President Trump and happened once before under President Obama, where we've denied uh, visas uh, to Iranian leadership. So I think we need to be doing that as, as well. You know, on the, on the latest deal, let me, let me give a slightly different perspective. So uh, when I was in the state legislature, I represented the district where Robert Levinson lived. Uh, and as congressman, I represent the district where Robert Levinson lived. And so he missed birthdays, he missed weddings, he missed a grandchildren, uh, and then he never came home because he died. Uh, and this was all done by the Iranian regime. And so I, I think we all support trying to bring Americans home. There's no doubt about that. The, the disagreement is what, what means are you willing to do that by, right? And so look, I am, I am extremely uncomfortable with giving the Iranian regime any dollars. But the problem is, and I don't know that there's a right answer for this, which is why I'm, I'm not necessarily gonna ask it. The problem is, is that <clears throat> when the regime you're dealing with won't make a deal without that, right? Do you tell those American families that we can't bring your family home because we're not willing to give the Iranian regime any money? And that becomes the tough part, right? And so, yeah, I, I don't want the Iranian regime to get any dollars because you we all know more than likely what will happen with that money. But at the same time, we have to figure out how to make families whole, American families whole when the, when the Iranians take them. You know, on the Abraham Accords, I, I think We've made tremendous progress. I want Saudi Arabia to join the Abraham Accords. I want Saudi Arabia to join the Abraham Accords, uh, not just from the Iranian perspective, not just from the Israeli perspective, but from the China, China perspective. If we don't bring Saudi Arabia in, then, then they're gonna go to China. Uh, and then you have the China, Iran, Saudi Arabia problem. And so I, I think to me, this is not just an Israel, Abraham Accords issue, this is a, a world peace from fighting against a destabilizing force uh, on Iran issue. Um, and, you know, I know there are lots of talks going on. Saudi Arabia wants, a, you know, maybe an Article 5-like protection. Look, I, I think we should give that to them. If that's what would get them away from China, away from uh, Iran, and into the Abraham Accords, I think that that could really change the perspective. On, on direct diplomacy, you know, I, I'm all for diplomacy. Uh, at all times. We're always talking, there's, there's diplomacy going on right now with Russia, with China, we're always talking. We should be doing the same thing with, Irani, with, with Iran, but we have to have a credible military threat. That's why diplomacy will work here. It will not work if we do not have a credible military threat. And by the way, th speaking about consistency, there's no doubt that there's been inconsistency on the American policy here over the last several administrations, and that has harmed us. But I'm not really convinced I know what the policy is today on the military threat. And so I support the chairman uh, on that, on the resolution, uh, that a sense of Congress saying that it's unacceptable for Iran to get a nuclear weapon. We all say that it's unacceptable. But what are we willing to do about that, right? And that's where I think America needs to speak uh, with one voice. Listen, I, it, it, there's no doubt that we've seen in the past these things work stuck next, you know, that the, the virus, that worked, right? Previous sort of, whether it's cyber or military interventions have worked. We all know right now, 
the only reason why the centrifuges aren't going up is not because of anything we're doing, it's because the Iranians are not doing it, right? And it, they could do it at any moment. It's not like we have some lever that would stop them. They could do it at any moment. And most likely, we'll find out after the fact because they're so close. So it wouldn't be we could do a preemptive military strike to stop it. It would be post. We would find out that they've hit the threshold, and then it would be what are we willing to do. And so, listen, I think maybe more joint military exercises in the Middle East, I think showing maybe the Iranian regime, the military capabilities we have in the Middle East by doing maybe some weapons tests out there. They need to understand what we're willing to do, and then we do the diplomacy. Then we sit down with them, and and we try to we try to work this out. And so, listen, this is a bipartisan issue. We I, I do think uh, we should continue to say we stand with the Iranian people. We should do everything we can and sit down with our allies, as you as you pointed out, to try to build a coalition. The same coalition we built with Ukraine, we should be building a similar coalition with Iran. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Jared Moskowitz. We now proceed to Congressman Tim Burchett of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I issue my disgust with what really is going on in Iran. Y'all believe that this administration's weak policies have allowed Iran to come closer to developing a nuclear bomb. And I'm sorry if you've already answered these questions, but just act surprised and and when I ask you these questions. Anyone? Uh Yes. In fact, there was a, a little bit of a timeline with, with respect I, took, um, I would take umbrage with, with what Representative Connolly said about the effectiveness of even previous measures that this administration is trying to restore. If you look at the timeline of Iran's nuclear escalation, Iran went from incremental nuclear escalation overtly violating the JCPOA in 2019, but significantly began violating the JCPOA in late 2020. At the end of 2021, at the end of the Biden administration's first year in office, Iran gained, according to outside nuclear experts, irreversible nuclear knowledge, doing things it had never done before. One, enrichment of uranium to 60 percent purity, a threat Iran made a decade ago but only felt comfortable acting on in 2021. Two, the production of uranium metal using highly enriched uranium which has clear applications for warhead designs and, and, and metallurgy, and three, uh, phasing in, testing, deploying, and using more advanced centrifuges, the machines that spin uranium. Is, so yes, quantitatively, qualitatively, it has grown under President Biden's watch. Is there any way we can um, inspect these nuclear facilities, honestly? I mean, is this going to be one of these made-for-TV specials that they just drive around with the little UN blue hats on and, and everyone makes a mockery of it? Sir. The International Atomic Energy Agency's access to these facilities has been severely restricted. Cameras have been denied. Can you speak up a little bit? Cameras have been denied to the IEA. Data from some cameras has been denied. At present, the International Atomic Energy Agency judges, and we should have confidence in that basic judgment, that it still understands the general capability of that program. But because of the erosion of its access, the time will likely soon come when the IA itself will be forced to say it is no longer certain that Iran's program has an entirely peaceful nature. And if I can add one more comment to okay, quickly, my colleagues' please. things. If Iran is permitted to keep 60 percent enrichment by the United States international community, which has no civilian application, have we not just agreed that Iran can have a nuclear military yes, nuclear sir. program? I agree with that. Um, I, I also, um, I'm worried about the money, this so-called humanitarian aid, where it goes. I mean, are we going to trust somebody that we don't trust? Obviously, it's going to be used to oppress folks. Something else that needs to be, maybe it's been stated, but what's going to happen, the only way you're going to take this out once they get it is through a, a military strike. And what I fear is it's going to be Israel that does it. And then when they do it, the people surrounding them will then possibly launch an attack on them. I don't know, how do you put the genie back in the bottle? Does anybody have any idea other than regime change? Is there any other, um, we've decided to, to put our, instead of taking the gloves off, we put them back on dealing with these thugs. And I just don't, I don't see the um, international community addressing this as it should. It should be sanctions they've worked in the past, economic. I mean, if we're not going to uh, 
send cruise missiles over there, then that gamut the only other thing we've got. Any thoughts on that? Any of y'all, ma'am? I'll just say that I think effective American leadership can, in fact, rally the world against significant threats, as we've seen with respect to both U Ukraine and China. I will also point out that where we've seen Iran's nuclear escalation, it has come after catastrophic U.S. decisions, such as the 2018 decision to uh, exit the Iran nuclear deal, as well as the 2019 failure to respond to attacks on Saudi Arabia by Iranian missiles and drones. I would also add to that, however, that the sanctions of the Trump administration restored what is properly termed the maximum pressure campaign or maximum pressure sanctions, created the same, if not greater, macroeconomic damage to Iran's economy in one to two years than a decade of multilateral sanctions. So there is no substitute for American power. There is no substitute for American leadership. That's a critical thing to note. And we can afford no own goals in the management of our relationships with our transatlantic partners. In 2020, Europe laughed at the Trump administration for trying to unilaterally extend an arms embargo on Iran. In 2022, Central Europe was the victim of a widening radius of Iranian arms and drone proliferation. No more laughing at unilateral attempts. We need to build bridges, not destroy them. Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Congressman Tim Burchett of Tennessee. And now we proceed to the very persistent Congressman John Molinar of the Republic of Michigan. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you, and uh, I appreciate you and the committee uh, the opportunity to join you today, and I uh, appreciate the bipartisan nature of the work being done in this committee, and one area of bipartisanship in my home state is a resolution Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin and I have introduced together. Uh, our resolution, HRES 5554, uh, makes a strong statement in support of Chaldean Christians and other ethnic minorities in Iraq who have faced persecution for a long time. Our own government has said this persecution constitutes a genocide and that we are deeply concerned about the oppression religious minorities in the area, in this area of the world face because of their faith. Uh, I believe that passing this resolution would send a strong message to the governments around the world, including Iran, Iraq, and others that the U.S. will not abide by the persecution of religious minorities. Uh, our resolution recognizes that religious minorities in Iraq have been an integral part of the cultural fabric and history of Iraq and the broader Middle East for thousands of years. And there's a rich history of cultural contributions in this region. In my home state, we're blessed to have a large population of Chaldeans who have made our community a better place. They contribute to Michigan society in many ways and many of those had to flee to escape persecution remain connected to their homeland. I hope that as this committee looks at ending Iran's malign activities around the world, that it considers the plight of religious minorities in the Middle East who are often targeted for violence and oppression. Chaldeans, Yazidis, and other groups have faced horrific events, and many of their ancestral communities have been forever changed. Iran's violent actions in destabilizing the region have no doubt contributed to the cycles of bloodshed. We also know that Iran wants to destabilize Iraq, its government, and the people who live there. This includes dividing the population and turning people of different faiths against one another. And I believe that passing HRES 554 will affirm the support of the United States for the religious and ethnic minority survivors of genocide in Iraq. When we stand with them, we send a clear message to Iran and others about religious freedom, our own values, and how we expect Chaldeans and other religious minorities of Iraq to be treated by their own government and others. Uh, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I do appreciate our witnesses and was hoping I could ask you a few questions. Uh, Mr. Rule, um, there's a territory in northern Iraq that is neither firmly in the control of the Iraqi central government nor the Kurdistan regional government, Iran and Iranian-backed militia have filled this void. Could you explain what means are available for the U.S. in this part of Iraq to further the independence and freedom of the indigenous populations in these areas? Thank you. Um, Iran's efforts to use its own personnel and uh, proxies to occupy portions of uh, eastern Syria and western Iraq is done for a variety of reasons to include the ability to build a land route to deliver weapons from Iran to Syria to Lebanese Hezbollah. 
interdiction and prevention of this, it greatly increases stability in the Middle East. The best way that we can work this is by working through local partners who know the area the best, and we have a variety of very strong local partners. This will be complicated, and also strong intelligence collection regarding Iranian and proxy activities will be needed. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Talbalu, the Iraqi Constitution nominally acknowledges the right to religious freedoms and expressly name the minorities to which this applies. Uh, yet influenced by Iran, they continue to move in the direction of a theocracy, which is the antithesis to religious freedom. Uh, what levers does the U.S. government have in this regard? Well, there's likely several levels, but one is actually making sure the U.S. has an Iraq policy. I'm not quite sure we have one at best. It's like a hybrid AFPAC policy on counter-ISIS between the territories that Norm mentioned between Syria and Iraq. We actually need a whole of Iraq policy. The Iraqis routinely come asking for sanctions waivers. There was just $10 billion given to the Iranians by way of Iraq. There's lots of levers for pressure there. There's the continuing, uh, you know, what's left of the continuing counter-ISIS campaign. There's potential efforts to help uh, get foreign direct investment into Iraq's energy system. Sector. There's tons of desalinization, environmental programs that could be used. Uh, in short, if we don't have an Iraq policy, none of these will function as real levers for us to affect any kind of change on the ground. But any kind of change on the ground would require sustained political interest and appetite in that in America, which, with immense respect, I don't see. I want to again thank you for all being here and, and your testimony today. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman John Molinari, and we appreciate very much your dedication to the people of Michigan that you have been here for the entire uh, hearing uh, and actually paid attention. And so we appreciate uh, your uh, attention and uh, your dedication to the people of Michigan. Uh, along with that, as we conclude, I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions, along with the talented and dedicated congressional staff who have helped uh, today, and they're available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. Uh, would, the witnesses are invited to remain in place for a picture with the, with the committee members present. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>